Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now here's your host. Hey, Karen, how are you? Hi, Mark. I'm great. Lovely to be with you. Awesome. Hey, um, how is your 2024 starting off? Uh, well, started off with my husband having COVID and canceling a Martin oh, Luther no. King Day vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but things are looking up. Yes, he, he is all healed and back at work. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's real. That's the story of a lot of people start to 2024, isn't it? That that is, but um, I know that towards the end of last year, you did have some good news because I, you know, you started a new role at Vistatech. I think you're the director of sales life sciences. That's right. Was that about six it months did. ago? It was the very end of August, whatever that is now. <laughs> yeah, we must be at the five month yeah. mark. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, so what I want to talk to you about is actually. I, with Memo Talks, typically we'll pick a topic and then drill down on it. And I, I do want to talk about what's going on in life sciences localization. Um, I think there's some movements for a more diverse, you know, uh, grouping of people for clinical trials. Um, there's the adoption and application of AI and probably a lot of other things that I'm not even aware of. But before we get into that, I'm kind of fascinated. You know, I mean, I, I looked at your um, your LinkedIn bio and you actually have a PhD from Cambridge University, which is very impressive. I think you also have a master's in um, uh, life sciences. Chemistry with um, French. Yeah, chemistry maybe it's, I think it's French. chemistry, chemistry with yeah, French. And French. Yes, yeah. which is awesome because you've got this science <laughs> and art combined there. So, how did you go from becoming a a doctorate yeah, yeah, in yeah. chemistry? Yeah, did um, I go from and, there to here? Yeah. To, yeah, yeah. How, what brought you into the, the to the Loke industry? What brought you to the yeah. dark side? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's the bright side. Um, okay, so, well, yes. So I always loved science and languages, right? You know, at school when they say, what mm -hmm. was your favorite subject? I always loved chemistry and I always loved French or whatever other language I could get my hands on. So I did what you in the US you would call I majored in chemistry and I had a minor in French and I studied abroad for a year in France. So that was the, the starting point, right? As an adolescent, the things I loved. Um, I wanted to be a bilingual, bicultural person early on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my that year when I studied abroad, I didn't actually study in the university. I had a job. I worked for um, Rompulank, which is part of Sanofi right now. Um, yep. And then I carried on and did a PhD and Zeneca, part of AstraZeneca now, sponsored that PhD. Um, and so I was toddling along. I was in research. Then I, I wanted to, well, I, PhD, I mean, it's great. I have a PhD from Cambridge. Yes, that's correct. Um, but I knew quickly when I was in the research world that I wanted to be in a more practical uh, application. So I worked with moved straight into industry, worked for uh, SmithKline Beecham. So that's part of GlaxoSmithKline, right? I was a development chemist. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved to Bristol Myers Squibb, which is st still called Bristol Myers Squibb, unlike all those other ones which have merged or something over the time, right? So I had. Let me stop yeah. you for a second, because, you know, I know you've lived in the U.S. for, for many, many years. And it's funny because yeah. I just kind of spaced out and was thinking that you were American. And then I kind of, uh, you know, just I started listening to your accent a little bit. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> she didn't grow up in America. Yeah, yeah. So, OK, I'll. I'll... <laughs> so, yeah, I so, 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 yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not the, I'm the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, so but let me ask you, because like in the U.S., in a lot of places, if somebody said, hey, I want to grow up and be bilingual and bicultural, especially in my generation, that was kind of a rare or unique. I didn't meet a lot of people growing up. I went to the biggest high school in Washington State. I didn't meet a lot of people who um, were either bilingual or who aspired to move overseas. And so, you know, where you grew up, was there was there a Scotland. lot more interest in learning other languages? Um, well, uh Europe generally is better than the USA, right? We can generalize hugely and and, and not be wrong there. Um, I just always, you know, 
how some people just hear languages and, and absorb it and want to learn it and manage to pick it up and want and and I have that right I I I um I have that and I always had that interest in wanting to know how other people live now when I was a teenager or a child I didn't understand that um what understanding how other cultures are would bring me you know the difference in approach to time or to authority or to all the things that vary from one culture to another I didn't understand that as a child but I wanted it as a child. You know, I, I thought it was fascinating mm -hmm. and I still can remember my parents giving me French francs on the campsite and being allowed to go and buy my baguette, you know, when I was 12 years old and on a, on some camping summer vacation. So I have, um, I, I had a little exposure to the world outside an English speaking world as a child, um, mainly in France, uh, because that was closest, right? Um, right. And um, I would say generally, I mean, it's falling away. The UK, we have the whole EU Brexit scenario, the shenanigans that we probably don't want to talk about. But um, there are, um, you know, when it's close to you, it's much easier. You know, I live in Colorado right now. Now, absent the obvious um, immigrant populations where I could go and find a conversation in Spanish or in uh, the languages of South Sudan, in my local, in my city, because of immigrant populations, I mean, the people here would have to drive for what, 18 hours to Mexico. It's a long way to find somewhere that they speak another language. So, yeah, so I did grow up in France. I mean, sorry, I grew up in Scotland. I, one thing I didn't say along the way in that work experience, I picked up a French husband. <laughs> so my lovely husband is Eve. <laughs> so um, that year that I spent a study abroad year that I met my husband um, then so we were 19 so we're now 51 so that makes a long time of a bilingual bicultural household marriage family whatever you want to call it yeah I mean I'm I'm pretty envious of majority of of Europe because it's so easy to get around and visit two or three four different countries in a week right and and then so if you want to pick up a language um, or learn a new language, you have the opportunity to practice it. In, an, in growing up in the States, just like you said, it's, it's, it's maybe difficult to imagine, hey, I mean, why am I studying French if I'm never going to be able to use it? Right. Um, but I did find that there are certain people that just kind of have this natural curiosity about other cultures and other languages. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that from a very young age, you know, you kind of had that. And I didn't have it until I started traveling overseas. And then I just, my mind exploded and I'm like, oh my God, I got to learn everything about this stuff because it's so cool. Right. So, okay. Back forward. So you did that year abroad. You picked up a husband, right. got, so a couple, I was, got a so job. I grew up in Scotland. Indeed. <laughs> you're the very, accent you're very you, productive. <laughs> yeah. Very no, hey, so you, um, you, uh, by now your audience, your listeners have all picked up that my accent is Scottish. Yes. I forgot to say that. I usually like to start with that because Otherwise, people are wondering uh, if I'm from Ireland or where else am I from and guessing. Anyway, yeah, I'm from Ayrshire originally. Um, so with that that French husband, we were married by this point when, <laughs> when I was in Ireland working on these in some of these pharma companies that I mentioned. Um, we were married um, and we emigrated. We came into the U.S. on visa. Uh, uh, he, he was a software developer. So, so uh, we came, we moved to the U.S. in our 20s. I worked in cosmetics and topical medical devices. So now that's a broader life sciences area, right? Until now, everything's been pharma. It's been, it's been chemistry. It's been small molecule drug development. Then, so I worked for cosmetics and topical medical device companies. So thing, things like... Um, wound gels or something else that a hospital would use to put on you, but it goes on you, right, to help a wound heal or whatever. Um, so, and I ended all that being a quality assurance manager in that, for that company. Um, they had children. Um, so long story short, I took a career break. Um, I stayed, I had three children in four years. Um, and after I finished having those efficient. children, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you're funny. Um, then I became, I discovered the world. I was looking for something to do that would use my brain 
and give me the flexibility of looking after these three kids. So that's when I became a freelance translator. So that is really when I got into localization. So I became a, I was a French to English translator, a highly specialized subject matter expert covering all that subject matter expertise that we've just mentioned. Also a localized English um, for in a broader range of, uh, of, of uh, content. Um, and, um, basically I thrived and did, uh, was a successful, uh, highly specialized, uh, linguist for, for years, um, while I had, uh, small children, medium sized children. Um, so everything from, uh, the linguistic validation, the back translation that we know happens in life sciences, um, audit reports for submission to the FDA, um, SME writing and training for other translators, well, a whole spread of things. So let me let me ask you, like, I mean, because a lot of people come in and they say, oh, I'm bilingual and I'm going to be a translator. And a lot of people, they they don't have that specialty or that subject matter expertise and they do just kind of general translation. Yeah. Um, how did you, did you, I mean, did, did somebody offer you a job and say, hey, I need help with this? I mean, what led you, because you, very quickly you, you, you figured out that, hey, I can focus, yes. I've got this background, um, I can focus in a, in a kind of lucrative area. Um, yeah. how, how did you figure that out? Well, I, ha I joined the American Translators Association. And they have some good getting started instructions. It's much better, even better now than it was then. But so I, I joined I, that. I went, I was living near Lake Tahoe in northern Nevada at that time. Um, and I went to the Northern California Translators Association meetings. That was the very first time I met translators and people from LSPs. It was in the Bay Area. Um, uh, so I met people. I found out what was what. Um, my very first jobs, honestly, I got them from something where, which some of, a lot of your uh, listeners will be familiar with a website called pros.com that, that's a sort of marketplace for, um, uh, for, for localization work. Um, and my first two jobs, I got them in a holiday period. So it was people whose uh, usual linguists weren't available and they were looking for new talent and I got them there. So I, I, that was where I got my start actually. And and then at what point did you realize that hey you know this is something that's got wheels and I wanna I wanna like you know really dig in and, and so ramp up. I was turning down work because I couldn't handle the volume four months after I declared myself a freelance translator. Now that's really unusual, wow. but when you get to put PhD chemist in the subject line of your emails to agencies who have life sciences, <laughs> chemical, <laughs> cosmetics companies. Um, they really need you and they, they don't question. It's like, right. oh yeah, we want her. So um, I, it, it took off way more quickly than we had expected. My husband had to watch the kids in the evenings for a while, while I, like, I had to get up to speed. You know, I was using cat tools, but I was still learning everything as I went. But clearly my subject matter expertise was enough to get me to, I was so far ahead of some of my peers who don't, ha who had to, you know, spend however many hours researching terms that I just knew because I'd lived that, um, it makes a huge difference. So your productivity is higher um, and your confidence is higher. And when they challenge you in something, you say, well, no, that's not actually how we say it in, in the industry. We say it this way. So you need to use this, uh, that kind of thing. So it just, it took off, took off fast and I was successful. It was a fun, fun time. And it was flexible. You were able to reinvent yourself um, not only once, but you did it again because eventually you moved into a sales right. and business development role. Um, right. How did that happen? Because so a lot of translators are. that was my are... How did it happen? Well, uh, approaching empty nest uh, and the <laughs> pandemic. So as mm -hmm. these are times of the, as everyone was thinking about what they wanted to be when they grew up during the pandemic, right? Everyone was reflecting on what really mattered and, and what they ought to keep doing. Um, and that coincided with our, by the end, you know, we, my youngest child is 20 now. So, uh, you know, they were, they were, they had left home or were leaving home. Long story short, I, uh, although um, I had been on the board of the American Translation Association for years, I had, I had 
been successful for many years. I was kind of at the top of my game and I'd been coasting a bit for a while. So I think it's fair to say that I, um, although I love translating, I still love it. I still poke around in it and open a cat tool and translate something periodically because it's fun and it reminds me where I came from. Uh, but I was ready for a change, um, something different. Um, I'm fundamentally an extrovert. And I had been for years translating away day in, day out and finding and feeding my extroversion by volunteering in my community or for professional associations or, or training and speaking and doing other things that fed my extroversion. So um, that was one of the reasons. So, so it was a lot of little things, lots of tipping points that pushed me into a leap. And yeah, I started in a sort of key account management Biz dev role in uh, spring of 2021. Did you reach out to a company or did they reach out to you and say, hey, you know, uh, let's talk about so, this kind of role? Because that's a, that's me, a big. Uh, yes. So I reached out. I told some of my friends, I told some people I was looking. And some of them told some people I was looking. <laughs> and then that's how I got my first job. And then this summer I moved and then I was someone found me. I wasn't looking to move from the place where I'd started, but someone found me and approached me and made me, you know, an offer I couldn't refuse kind okay. of thing. So. Okay. And then this like ties into a conversation I recently had with Robin Ayub from, uh, from Lionbridge, Canada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Robin and I have been salespeople most of our careers and we have given a lot of thought to, you know, different processes and techniques and strategies and so on, um, both for our, you know, our personal performance, but also for leading teams. And when you come in kind of as your third, you know, reinvention of yourself, uh, did you, did you like, you know, read a bunch of books? Did you do some online courses? Did you just kind of figure things out? How did you figure out how, how you're going to sell? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> A lot of shadowing peers and uh, watching people who are very good at what they're doing do it. Um, but I'd been running, I'd been running a business for 15 years. I'd been selling my own translation services, and and I was half, I was about 50 50 um, LSP clients and end clients. So I'd been working with, I'd be building accounts on my smaller scale forever. So it wasn't completely new to me. Um, I did. There's a great. There's a book called The Accidental Salesperson. I am the accidental mm -hmm. salesperson, and that's a good book. And yes, there are other books I've read. I've got a bunch. I love to read. There's a bunch of stuff on my shelf. Um, but honestly, I would say um, good instincts for people plus watching how my successful peers work. Um, are the most no, I think that's that's great things. advice. And 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 one thing that that I say is that it all starts when you're going to sell, you have to have confidence in what you're selling. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that mm -hmm. confidence starts with product knowledge or service knowledge and belief. So if, if you know the product or the service inside out, immediately you're going to have confidence when you go and talk to a prospective customer. And you'd been sure. doing that job for, um, for several years, many years. Um, and, and you understood both from the LSP side and from the, the end client side, you, you could you could speak their language. You, you know, you understood about right. back translation and clinical trials and everything like that. Exactly. And so you can go in and have an intelligent conversation with them. Yeah. 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 And I understand the technology piece and I understand the risk and the compliance. And yes, absolutely. I can speak their language. Um, and I, I know what um, working with an LSP looks like. Right. I, I've worked with so mm -hmm. many over the years that, I, you know, I've seen the good, the bad and the indifferent. Um, so there's all sorts of, um, I mean, and fundamentally, I mean, I keep on saying subject matter expertise, but that's what it is. I know, I know it inside out. So that makes it relatively yeah. easy to sell. And, and you're right. You, you said something about um, having confidence in the, in the product or service that you're selling. And I have that completely. I know that the people behind me at Vista Tech are, are so knowledgeable and smart um, that, uh, you know, I have complete confidence in what they're in, in what's in, in what's coming. If I manage to get the right conversation with the right people and we, uh, you know, we, we start working with a yeah. new client. 
That's awesome. The most fun I've ever had selling is when you've got just a solid team that can deliver and you just go out and you have so much confidence. You just talk to people, find out what they want and say, Hey, look, we'll put together a solution for you and deliver it. And it's just like so rewarding because, you know, you're helping them solve a problem and you're over, you know, you're hopefully Absolutely. under promising over delivering. And then you create, you create lifelong friends that way too, you know? So, can so let more. me ask you, okay. Cause you're out there. Yeah. You're yep. out there in the market. Um, and what, what are you seeing? What are, what are customers, you know, looking for? What are some d new industry trends in terms of life sciences localization that we need to be aware of? Yeah. So, well, um, there's new trends and there's sort of ever, ever changing trends. Regulate, right. We talk about the life sciences being regulated, right? So every time a regulation changes, mm -hmm. that drives something new. Um, so emerging regulations are always a hot topic. Um, and in 2023 and, and well, and before that, even it was uh, the European Union's medical device regulation. That was a that was mm -hmm. a big hot topic um, uh, because for those of your listeners who don't know, it hasn't been implemented as planned and there's great delays and it's prob causing problems for innovation. And it's a whole it's a whole bit of a mess. Um, but that regulation brings and requires translation at an earlier stage in the process before mm -hmm. uh, before a device is approved for the market. So it's, it greatly affects the, the work that we do for med and with medical device companies. Um, another thing that we hear, so in a different part of the life sciences space, if we look at the clinical space, um, clinical trials, you're all familiar with clinical trials, of course. Um, and in the pandemic, uh, you may or may not be familiar with the fact that people started doing what we call decentralized clinical trials, where not people couldn't travel into a hospital to get to do all the appointments. So we started to try, the, the industry started to try to, to shape something where people could enter all their data into a diary uh, originally, or perhaps a Chromebook or some other app on their phone. Um, so that decentralized trials situation has after it was at a peak in the pandemic, of course, when people couldn't do things in person. And now it's kind of stabilized into this new, very um, strong technology space where we where the where those apps need to have just they need to be have such great user interface so that patients will will enter the correct data and the trial will succeed. Right. If the software doesn't mm -hmm. work, if the app doesn't work, if the if the UI and the language in the in whatever tool they're they're entering their data in aren't correct, then then the then the pharma company, the sponsor of the trial, is much more likely to lose that patient and have them drop out of the trial. Uh, so that's a big that's an interesting area of innovation. Um, uh, diversity and inclusion in clinical trials is another hot topic that also somewhat came out of the pandemic when we were all. Um, we were all aware culturally that there were that, that COVID was affecting different populations differently, right? There were certain populations mm -hmm. where the, the statistics were just dreadful and much worse than other populations. And historically, it's fair to generalize and say that clinical trials were typically done on white men. So if you were female, if you were not white, there was there was a good chance that this medicine, this treatment wouldn't be wouldn't work in you the same way that it worked in the people that it worked, uh, that the, the trial was done on. So diversity and inclusion obviously includes the language piece. Right. So that is another driver for the services that we provide. Um, what else? Real world evidence is interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, if we're going to go back to the uh, decentralized trials, um, other yeah. than like, you know, you mentioned user interfaces of the technology, but how, how else does that affect localization workflows and or drive demand for localization services? Well, when you combine the diversity piece or the inclusion piece with the decentralized mm -hmm. piece, you've got to localize some at the apps, right? The, 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 however right. many, you know, the people decide that the so it used to be let's say if the trials were in person then then it would have been healthcare interpreters that were helping the uh limited english speaker for instance if you're in the us and it's a i don't know somebody whose native language is hindi is in a hospital participating mm -hmm. in a trial there would have been an interpreter nowadays that 
that that Hindi speaking native Hindi speaking person may be at home with a with their phone entering their vitals every day or uh, entering whatever it is um, that so so we're talking about software localization fundamentally and plain language mm -hmm. and really clear simple instructions that's that so it, it taught it so you asked how it affects our workflows and things it means that the linguists have to have a really strong grasp of what plain language is in the for their right. market right it means they, they can't just be translating what's there they really have to think about the difference between does the healthcare provider understand this or does the does the user does the patient understand this and that register register piece that's really interesting because i guess it, you know you really got to know who your audience is you know you come from a very technical background and if you wanted to translate content um, in, in the audience or, or other, you know, PhDs or researchers, you'd probably translate in a much more technical way. But when you talk about clinical trials, <laughs> excuse me, um, and some of the patient reported outcomes and so on and so forth, yes. uh, you need to translate uh, in the, even all the, the um, you, you mentioned the MDR stuff, you need to translate in something that's very readable and understandable yep. um, for the audience. Absolutely. And, yep. and, and, and that's how even you, regulated and as a, stated as a, in the MDR. It's actually written into the regulation mm -hmm. that the language must be, I forget the exact words now, it's, uh, I wish I could remember them, it's clear and something, I can't remember the other adjectives, but it, it, is, it is part of the regulation. Yeah, that plain language piece. And we talk in the US, we often talk about translating for an eighth grade level or a fifth grade level. In other parts of the world, we'll use different, you know, we use different uh, uh, guidelines for, for what uh, sort, what language level is called, called for for different user uh, requirements. So let me ask you this. I mean, there's a lot of concern these days in our industry, if you are a translator, that um, AI or LLMs are yeah. machine translation, yeah. a, or, you know, a, a combination of, of the two or three of them are going to are going to reduce demand and put a lot of people out of work or going to change the type of work they do. So they'll be like human in the loop versus just being a translator. Yeah. What are you seeing in the life sciences space in terms of the applications of AI and LLMs and what's yeah. the impact on translators? So um, it's a fair concern. And I think life sciences mm -hmm. is less affected than lots of other areas that are being affected first. So I think um, translators who are um, working for retail or for tech or various other verticals, um, where there's less regulation are being affected faster. I think certain markets are being affected faster. Fundamentally, in adding AI to a workflow in, in, increases risk, right? So people in life sciences are risk averse. There is, you know, if there's risk to life and limb, thank risk goodness. to patient safety, <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. right? It, it's kind of obvious yeah. when you, right? So um, an area like life sciences where people are naturally risk averse, is not going to be rushing, they're not going to be early adopters of all that's going on, right? Now, having said that, of course, AI, LLMs, MT are part of workflows these days. They are increasingly part of workflows, even in the life sciences world um, of translation. But I think it's fair to say we're behind the curve and following and adopting later. So uh, that, that would be how I would look at it. Uh, personally, so all those linguists who are scared, I think fundamentally it comes down to subject matter expertise. Yes, the work's changing. The mm -hmm. percentage of time when you start from scratch with a source text in front of you and produce a target text without the help of anything but your own brain and maybe a dictionary, um, I think those days are dying. They, they still exist, of course, and some linguists have clients who want them to work that way, and that's perfect. Uh, but... Um, the stronger a linguist subject matter expertise is, the more important they will be as uh, as we move forward, because we all know that um, AI makes mistakes, right? And it writes this stuff that looks beautiful, but it's just rubbish. It's junk. It's not correct. It's factually, it's factually all wrong, but it reads well. And only subject matter experts can tell that. 
right? So it's all mm. about the subject matter expertise, I think. Uh, so I think that we'll find that linguists who have truly done a great deal of professional development um, throughout their careers or people like linguists like me who've come in from another career and had a starting point and then kept it going. You know, you'll find lawyer linguists and linguists who used to be a nurse or linguists who were whatever. You know, a lot of linguists have had very interesting careers and reinvented themselves in the way that I have. Um, I think that those people will thrive. Um, I think that the young people coming out of university need to study a, a, a domain of excellence as well as the languages and the technology so that they have a chance of um, of doing something other than, you know, just, just well, I, I, so they don't get lost in the mix because uh, if you, you know. You know, I mean, I think you're you're extremely well connected in the life sciences industry. In fact, um, the last time MemoQ did a life sciences roundtable discussion, I think you introduced at least two, maybe three of the panelists. So thank you for that. Um, you have an amazing network. Um, I think you you were also director and secretary of the ATA for a while. Um, so let me ask you: if somebody, you know, they're they're either uh, transitioning careers or maybe they're just a, a graduate and they and they want to get into the life sciences localization space what are the important organizations or learning resources that yeah. they should leverage <clears throat> well these days there are things called MOOCs massive open online courses right MOOCs, MOOCs didn't mm -hmm. exist when I started you had to pay for that kind of amazing learning um, so people could take courses in all sorts of things that are going to help them um, more practically and specifically, there are um, associations like the Translation Associations you've mentioned. They often have a medical division or a science and technology division. And, and, and anybody aspiring to build a network and grow their skills should get involved there because there's going to be all sorts of content that's relevant to linguists with that subject expertise. Um, the other places I'd point people to are, are AMWA and EMWA, that's the European Medical Writers Association and the American Medical Writers Association. Those are both really good, really good, strong professional associations um, that do have freelancers in the mix, but um, a lot of, for instance, the medical writers and regulatory writers who are, who are professionals within the life sciences space um, are employed, they're employed by pharma companies or medical device companies. They're going to be members of AMWA and MWA and they're, they're growing their skills there. Um, because, I mean, we talked about plain language in, in the context of translation, but um, it starts with good writing for the source language as well. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. strong professional support for people who want to be uh, writing the, the source texts beautifully uh, to start with. So those are places I would guide people to go and see. I think that's some, some amazing advice. Um, maybe just a couple more questions in terms of, you know, looking forward over the next year, year and a half here, um, anything that the, our audience sh should be aware of in terms of, you know, developments in life sciences localization? Um, well, I would watch out for what finally happens with the European medical device regulation, if they actually manage to implement it or if they decide to completely restructure it because it's just not going to work. So I'll certainly have my eye on that. Um, so can you explain that a little bit? I mean, what, what's actually going on with it right now? It's so cumbersome that not enough Auditors, certified bodies, notified bodies uh, are able to certify the new, the, the existing products and any new products in a timely manner. So products aren't actually able to get to market because the reg it, it, that's fundamentally what's happening. There are companies who are choosing to drop certain products from their lines because the wow. new regulation is so cumbersome. So. That's what's going on there. Um, the other thing I would say is real world data and real world evidence. That's a really interesting topic. Uh, so we've mentioned clinical trials a few times. We're all familiar with the principle that uh, before something goes into a patient, it's tested in a controlled environment, right? 
But then we're also familiar, some of us, with the idea that once something's been out in the world, being prescribed for something, doctors sometimes see that it's actually quite good for something else or something different or off-label or some other thing. Um, and that becomes real-world data. And there's a move, there are moves afoot globally in the regulatory bodies to find a way to use that data in addition to what we've always traditionally used from clinical trials. Um, so, for instance, the FDA in the US just put out a new uh, guidance um, in the, at the end of December. They, they're trying to, it's not finalized yet, uh, but they're adding, you know, they're adding depth to to the guidance that they're giving uh, physicians and pharma companies um, to help them work out what qualifies as real world data and can be considered real world evidence that some that a, a drug, a device uh, does something effectively in a population. So that's really interesting topic that I enjoy looking into. And then and then how does that interpretation or decision affect localization because uh, because then it just it, i guess if you've got a, a more diverse um participant group for clinical trials yeah that doesn't have as obvious an effect as some of the other things like a diversity and equity inclusion movement um it's mm -hmm. it's more it's just more of the same more data more people from a wider population it, uh, it doesn't have a I don't think that will have a radical shift anything radically in what we do. It might be that the volumes of data over time become such that we have to look for strong AI solutions with with human expertise to to in terms of translation. But um, I wouldn't expect a radical shift in how we work from that. Cool. Well, I mean, you're definitely in an interesting space um, for for MemoQ. It's it's one of the areas that um, we've chosen to focus on just because we believe the uh, one I mean, we, 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 we say that we go after the premium um, translation or localization space and, and that those are the basically industries that care about quality right and are willing to you you know invest in quality whether that means on the tool side or on the service side etc um, but what we've seen is it's just the demand continues to be quite strong and the projections for the next seven eight ten years look very very strong uh, in terms of all the activity in the industry but then the um, the localization that that's going to drive so I think that we're both in a in a pretty good space there so hey <laughs> I agree it's good <laughs> Well, hey, um, Karen, thank you, thank you so much for being on MemoQ Talks. Um, any any uh, closing thoughts, comments, observations, uh, advice that you'd like to share with us? Um, uh, I'm going to say at Visitech, we're technology agnostic, so we always pick the best mm -hmm. solution for our clients' needs, and MemoQ is among those on the table. There's a parting thought thank for you, you. <laughs> and. Um, I, I, you know, I love what I do. I love, I love the fact that I've managed to combine this love for languages and the science that I studied, that I worked in. That I, I've managed to keep it all going and reinvent myself a couple of times along the way. Um, so if that, if the fact that you can do that, that I have done that, helps anyone along the way anytime, then that's something to. For me to be grateful for. No, I, I think your your enjoyment of what you do and your enthusiasm um, comes through loud and clear. Um, I do have one last question because I know you're an avid reader, and we ah. read some of the same books. Uh, yeah. So give give us give us a couple recommendations off your okay. recently read. All list. right, what I've got on my desk. Here we go. This is in the mess stack. Uh, Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. Um, Oh, I love this book. I just read it in the past few weeks. Um, it's about, well, unsurprisingly, how to think clearly. That was good. Um, I could use some of that. I could use, I could use like a couple doses of that. <laughs> yeah, ahead. we it's all need nice more of that, book. right? Kind of, I need a book like this every three months, right? And then I might start applying it all. Right. No, it's the kind of thing that's very practical and makes you think you ought to get it done. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the other, well, uh, keep it keep it real. The last, the other book I just finished was the Fourth Wing fiction. Uh, it's like a fantasy. Uh, it's it's a sort of 
I don't know, it's got dragons in it. It's It was my lightweight Christmas read. So <laughs> I read The Fourth Wing. I can't even remember the author's name, to be honest, but it's the first of a trilogy and the second one's come out as well. So um, I like to mix it up. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I do too. And it's funny because um, I think it was late November, early December, I read The, the Count of Monte, uh, Monte Cristo, you know, uh -huh. and I, because I, I've watched the movie a couple of times. And so I got the book and I didn't realize the book was like 1200 pages. And I was like, damn, <laughs> but, it's a but it's just like, once you get into it, you, I just couldn't stop. And I'd like, my family just had like, you know, where, where did you go? I just like disappeared for a week because I had to finish that <laughs> damn book. But of course I'm working and doing other things at the time, but no, I love, I love mixing it up. And, and, and I think for me, um, having some good fiction, some some kind of fantasy or something like that is really nice because it serves as a distraction or release from all the day to day kind of, you know, um, yeah. stuff. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, hey. It's been awesome. a real pleasure, Mark. Karen, thank you so much. Thank you for your friendship and thank you for helping us uh, with our Life Sciences Roundtables uh, in, in the past. And uh, thank you for coming on Memory Good Talks. See you soon, Mark. Bye. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks. 